The Ethernet cable was a major revolution from Xerox and it allowed us to then connect these computers together. Once we got over that hurdle, the next step was wide area networks. Okay, and a wide area network is pretty much a network that is bigger than your home or at our school. For instance, all the computers connected at our school are part of a local area network. That local area network connects with other local area networks and together they all end up forming a wide area network. Now, the internet is comprised of hundreds of thousands or millions of wide area networks. And all these wide area networks allow information to travel from different computers so that we all can connect to the internet. How does the information get there successfully? I mean, could the information get lost along the way? Could some email that you send suddenly skip a few pieces of information and so that it doesn't arrive at the computer that it's meant to? The solution is to chop up big transmissions into many small pieces called packets. Just like with message switching, each packet contains the destination address on the network, so routers know where to forward them. This format is defined by the Internet Protocol, or IP for short, a standard created in the 1970s. Every computer connected to a network gets an IP address. You've probably seen these as four 8-bit numbers written with dots in between. For example, 172.217.7.238 is an IP address for one of Google's servers. With millions of computers online all exchanging data, bottlenecks can appear and disappear in milliseconds. Network routers are constantly trying to balance the load across whatever routes they know to ensure speedy and reliable delivery, which is called congestion control. Sometimes different packets from the same message take different routes through a network. This opens the possibility of packets arriving at their destination out of order, which is a problem for some applications. Fortunately, there are protocols that run on top of IP, like TCP IP, that handle this issue. We'll talk more about that next week. Chopping up data into small packets and passing these along flexible routes with spare capacity is so efficient and fault tolerant, it's what the whole internet runs on today. This routing approach is called packet switching. It also has the nice property of being decentralized with no central authority or single point of failure. In fact, the threat of nuclear attack is why packet switching was developed during the Cold War. Today, routers all over the globe work cooperatively to find efficient routings, exchanging information with each other using special protocols like the Internet Control Message Protocol, ICMP, and the Border Gateway Protocol, BGP. The world's first packet switch network and the ancestors of the modern internet was the ARPA Internet, named after the US agency that funded it, the Advanced Research Projects Agency. Here's what the entire ARPANET looked like in 1974. Each smaller circle is a location, like a university or research lab, that operated a router. They also plugged in one or more computers. You can see PDP-1s, IBM System 360, and even an atlas in London connected over satellite link. Obviously, the internet has grown by leaps and bounds in the decades since. Today, instead of a few dozen computers online, it's estimated to be nearing 10 billion, and it continues to grow rapidly, especially with the advent of Wi-Fi connected refrigerators, thermostats, and other smart appliances, forming an internet of things. For your computer to get this video, the first connection is to your local area network, or LAN, which might be every device in your house that's connected to your Wi-Fi router. This then connects to a wide area network, or WAN, which is likely to be a router run by your internet service provider, or ISP. Companies like Comcast, AT&T, or Verizon. At first, this will be a regional router, like one for your neighborhood, and then that router connects to an even bigger WAN, maybe one for your whole city or town. There might be a couple more hops, but ultimately you'll connect to the backbone of the internet, made up of gigantic routers with super high bandwidth connections running between them. When it absolutely, positively needs to get there, programs use the Transmission Control Protocol, or TCP, which, like UDP, rides inside the data payload of IP packets. 
For this reason, people refer to this combination of protocols as TCP IP. Like UDP, the TCP header contains a destination port and checksum, but it also contains fancier features, and we'll focus on the key ones. First off, TCP packets are given sequential numbers, so packet 15 is followed by packet 16, which is followed by 17, and so on for potentially millions of packets sent during that session. These sequence numbers allow a receiving computer to put the packets into the correct order, even if they arrive at different times across the network. So if an email comes in all scrambled, the TCP implementation in your computer's operating system will piece it all together correctly. When your computer wants to make a connection to a website, you need two things, an IP address and a port, like port 80 at 172.217.7.238. This example is the IP address and port for the Google web server. In fact, you can enter this into your browser's address bar like so, and you'll end up on the Google homepage. This gets you to the right destination, but remembering that long string of digits would be really annoying. It's much easier to remember google.com. So the internet has a special service that maps these domain names to addresses. It's like the phone book for the internet and it's called the domain name system or DNS for short. You can probably guess how it works. When you type something like youtube.com into your web browser it goes and asks a DNS server, usually one provided by your ISP, to look up the address. DNS consults its huge registry and replies with the address. In fact, if you try mashing your keyboard, adding .com and then hit enter in your browser, you'll likely be presented with an error that says DNS failed. That's because the site doesn't exist, so DNS couldn't give your browser an address. But if DNS returns a valid address, which it should for YouTube.com, then your browser shoots off a request over TCP for the website's data. There's over 300 million registered domain names, so to make our DNS look up a little bit more manageable, it's not stored as one gigantically long list, but rather in a tree data structure. What are called top level domains or TLDs are at the very top. These are huge categories like .com and .gov. Then there are lower level domains that sit below that, called second level domains. Examples under .com include google.com and dftba.com. Then there are even lower level domains called subdomains, like images.google.com and store.dftba.com. And this tree is absolutely huge. Like I said, more than 300 million domain names, and that's just second level domain names, not all the subdomains. For this reason, the data is distributed across many DNS servers, which are authorities for different parts of the tree. 